Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Tom Shebrick today about supply chain management resiliency. Um, Tom, you've given us a lot to think about um, in segment one and segment two. Now, let's say we don't, we're not as familiar with supply chain management um, that we should be. You know, what are some of the best practices that we can look up and, and we should follow? Yeah, a great question, Alex. And uh, I'm going to draw back to where we, we ended uh, in the, the last segment um, and some of the dependency uh, considerations. Uh, I would suggest, um, even if it's at a very high level, to get an understanding of the end-to-end process flow uh, within that supply chain network. Um, and so the example that I had run through was really from uh, sort of conception of we want to sell this product to producing it, uh, it being manufactured. Manufactured, uh, and then ultimately it being shipped and then sold in a store. Um, very, very complex. Once you've got that end-to-end process drawn out, uh, I would look at it and tr- uh, work with the, the teams in the, the areas that perform those functions, and, and perhaps it's doing a BIA or a business impact analysis with, uh, with some of those various functions to identify uh, what are the most critical cogs within that wheel. Um, and it gives you a good starting point. So if I, if I was to throw it a number, and, and this is just um, not throwing a, a dart at the board necessarily, it's, it's more of an educated number, but not you know, a perfect one. Um, in that mix, you're probably going to have 30 to 40 um, processes um, that tie into probably 10 different business units uh, that, that make up that end-to-end uh, flow for the, that one particular product. Um, so obviously not all of them are going to be as critical, um, but it gives mm-hmm. you a good starting point, I guess, if you can identify which ones are the most critical and do some more strategic planning, risk assessments, et cetera, against those. So I think that, that serves as a, a best practice or as a good starting point. Um, if I focus on sort of a, a response to a, a situation or crisis management situation, if you will, um, the one important thing, particularly if it's affecting supply chain, uh, is, is I've learned to let supply chain lead. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of our, our conversation that um, these guys are great problem solvers. They put out fires on a regular basis as part of their job. Um, they, they, nine times out of ten, know what needs to be done. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes my role is uh, helping guide them if we're not quite there. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the time I'm taking their lead um, and then I'm taking their message and sharing with senior leadership so that they know what's going on and, and we can let those guys continue to work on the the, the problem at hand that they're faced with. Um, so I think letting supply chain lead because they're good at it. Uh, not in all cases, but by and large, my experience has been that they're, they're very good at it. Uh, and then the, the last thing I think is uh, part of our conversation, we started looking outside and we talked about third-party vendors, et cetera. Um, but I think uh, really, really focusing on the internal and doing that end-to-end process mapping is a good start. Uh, and then from there, who are those critical processes dependent on? And then looking externally to those vendors and making sure that we've got a good understanding of the services that they provide to us uh, and determine if we need to do any additional assessment to, against them to, to make sure that that supply chain continuum is, is kept sound and, and solid. You, you mentioned an interesting point, let supply chain lead. Now, and you said, you know, not in all situations. Uh, can, am I assuming correctly if I say that if it's a, uh, like a business as usual incident type thing, like a production type in, incident you know, with, a, with a vendor, not, not, you know, the building is on fire? Correct. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier in touch wood that I'm not jinxing us, but uh, <laughs> uh, we've been very fortunate that we haven't had anything major happen at one of our, our facilities in, in recent memory. Um, so I'm thinking more of some of the, the outward type uh, incidents, the day-to-day stuff. Like if it's if the uh, something's happened somewhere and we're providing community support, for example, uh, they're going to know what to do. They just need to be told what, right? So we'll tell them what product needs right. to get there and, and, and in what location uh, and, and leave them to kind of maneuver and do their, their thing to, to get it there as quickly as possible. Are, are there, so you mentioned the um, understanding the end-to-end process flow and BIA. Would it be um, more than a, a BIA? Because a BIA tell, you know, 
tells you, you know, desired recovery time objectives and identifies the processes and hopefully identifies dependencies. But would it encapsulate a little bit more uh, internally to figure out what that process flow is? Because sometimes, you know, a user only knows what they receive and who they send it to. And then that's the end of it. Yeah, a great question, I, I suppose. And I, I hadn't given much thought. I was looking at uh, uh, the scenario through my lens and, and so the... Um, over the number of years, I guess I've been practicing this and, and performing uh, BIAs or, or creating, uh, you know, the sets of questions that we ask in, in those sessions. Uh, we do focus heavily on dependencies, um, so I, it would be, I guess, an enhanced BIA or a BIA plus. Uh, so, great question, mm. Alex. I, you definitely, uh, obviously, want the quantitative stuff, uh, but there's some qualitative pieces as well, and and uh, some contextual things. I think that we need to understand understand in that end-to-end process flow. So I would say it depends on the, the depth and breadth of your, your BIA. Um, and if it's, mm-hmm. if it's not hitting on those connection points appropriately, um, you know, that, that you're exploring those a little more deeply, uh, whether that's through some other form of assessment uh, via, you know, your risk management program and a risk assessment, uh, or uh, understanding that, hey, I've got these two critical processes that are intersecting here. Uh, we need to understand those relationships a little bit better and having additional conversations or, or ways to explore uh, those connection points. Yeah, because those connection points would be the, you know, your, your big risks or where, you know, if anything happens here, look, look what the downstream impact is, you know, which would lead back again to your BIA. But at the same time, you know, a user may not know all of those impacts. You know, they only know what impacts them really, right? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, so... Uh, and the challenge is everyone has a different level of maturity in terms of their their programs and, and how they mm-hmm. execute and, and operate on these things. Um, but even if they are done separately, um, uh, hopefully uh, there's some work being done by your business continuity practitioners to ensure that those dots are connecting at the right place. So if you've got process A, uh, and it's dependent on process B within four hours, but process B's recovery time is 24 hours. Uh, somebody needs to reconcile that that disconnect, and and that could come through uh, from your BIA. But there is some level of analysis that needs to be done to make sure that all of those dependencies, whether they're internal or external, are syncing up and connecting in the appropriate way. That's right. a big watch out. So, with your uh, experience with supply chain management, what are some? Of, what do you think some of the key challenges are? You know, what what have your insights been, you know, it, working in, in supply chain management for such a long time? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I um, I think there's two, and, and they go hand in hand. Um, one is volume. Um, so, in volume of relationships, uh, whether that be internal or external, um, we talk about that end-to-end process flow and, and the amount of connections that go through it. So I, I just think it's uh, size, scope, and breadth is challenging. Um, and, and I think it's um, understanding, I suppose. And we touched on it just a, a minute ago, but the, 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 the connections are happening at the right points at the right time. Um, and understanding the plan B, if that connection, you know, isn't being made what the the alternative solution is. I don't think that there's been enough thought given to some of those um, what if scenarios uh, in the event of the, that that continuum and if something fails along the way. But I think we're getting better. I think when I say we, uh, the collective we being, you know, resiliency professionals in, in the work that we're doing in that space. So what, knowing that um, you know, your insights here, though, those understanding the, the key points and the volume and the breadth of relationships, are there any key things that you think um, you know, people out there, you know, we need to change what we're doing when, when it comes to supply chain management? You know, anything that you know, wisdom that you, know, you may have <laughs> uh, to, to just kind of say, you know, we, we really need to start doing more of this. 
Yeah, I, I would say um, I, I'm a firm believer in, in doing, uh, conducting more fulsome risk assessments. Uh, and if that's part of your business continuity program and the BIA work that you're doing to, to make sure that you understand those connection points, great. Um, but if somebody's analyzing, you know, the information that's coming back, uh, and I use the, the example of the, the two dependencies not connecting in terms of their, their tolerable outage timeframes and, and dependency on one another, um, to get those business areas talking and, and working together. So um, that that's not always easy to do, I guess, and, and making sure that people have the appropriate amount of time is, is always going to be the, the challenge. But I think as, as practitioners that, that we poke at those things and, and make sure that the, the business is understanding them. Um, I think the the implementation of more risk based a more risk based mindset is really really important. I think we have to leverage that a lot more um, so if that relationship uh, between those two processes um, is not exactly where we want it to be and it represents a risk, uh, making sure that there's a forum for reporting of that risk uh, and either uh, an avenue to uh, implement some solutions to mitigate it uh, or that mm-hmm. someone is accepting that risk within the organization. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, uh, you know, the more that we incorporate or bring sort of the business continuity and risk management worlds together, um, the better mm-hmm. off we're going to be in. And we've seen that over the, the you know several years now that that those two um, uh, portions of the business I guess are more integrated and working more and more together but I, I think uh, uh, the more that we refine and mature those relationships and, and make sure that we're calling out risks appropriately and, and either mitigating them uh, or having some form of risk acceptance taken against them. I agree. I, th- I think uh, the risk management and BCM, you know, need to work closer. I am, I'm completely on side with that. Um, I'm going to ask you, do you have any war stories you can tell with, with regards to supply chain management? And they don't have to be yours if, if you don't want to give anything away. But, you know, any horror stories that, you know, where people didn't consider supply chain management? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a, a big, bad kind of uh, monstrous one. And I, I'd urge anyone that's listening to, to read up on this particular example. It's a really good one. So I'll give you the 30,000-foot the view of it. But uh, back in the summer of 2015, um, there was a big explosion in the port of Tianjin, China, um, so there was a, a bunch of chemicals that were being stored at this port, um, but there's also a whole heap of uh, retail products that were being shipped to a, a number of retailers across North America. Um, so uh, one of the chemicals they had been storing was ammonium nitrate. Uh, and when uh, uh, these explosions started to occur, uh, everybody was scrambling to try to get an understanding of whether their product was affected. Um, Several, several challenges came out of it. So um, there was product at the port uh, that couldn't be released until there was some sort of detection to determine, you know, what the um, the chemical exposure was, I guess, to the containers. Um, there was a lack of understanding of what might have already been on a ship. Um, on the water, but still at the port, and whether it was released or not, um, what product was on the water and, and bound for the port of Vancouver. Um, and so that was one element of it. So what was where um, after that horrific thing happened? Uh, and that was, a, you know, it's sort of interesting, I guess, when you think about third parties. Um, the port itself, we wouldn't have considered a, a third party for the organization that I was working for at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But the, the broker who manages all of the flow of that product was. Um, but they were at the mercy of the port for the information that they were receiving. Hmm. So, interesting. Yeah, I, I remember one. seeing uh, something on the And then the other the interesting news. piece was when we got the product finally at the port of Vancouver, um, we didn't know what may have been contaminated versus not. Um, so there was a, a process for holding those containers, testing the product within them, uh, and then, you know, making some decisions on, you know, what was safe and what was not. And um, the great thing was, uh, you know, that uh, anything where we were in doubt, uh, we destroyed. Um, so we did lose quite a bit of product in that process. Uh, and then it became a, a really, really challenging um, insurance conversation uh, to determine, you know, who was responsible um, because we had made good business decisions um, 
you know, to basically protect the, the public and our customers at the time. Um, and so uh, was that a business decision or was it a result of the explosion uh, and should be reimbursed by insurance? So it's kind of a beefy one, I suppose. We could probably talk a whole hour about just that case study or that example, but uh, uh, it shows some of the complexity when something like that does happen. And certainly happy to take that conversation offline with anybody if they care to reach out. Well, we've got uh, less than two minutes left. Um, Do you want to take one minute and give us any final thoughts you have on supply chain? Yeah, I guess uh, um, if I sum all of this stuff up, um, and we covered a lot of ground in in the time that we had, Alex, I I think uh, it's really, really important for practitioners, whether it be on the risk side or the business continuity side, to understand, at least at a high level, the end-to-end continuum or flow of um, anything within their supply chain, no matter how small or big it is, um, to take uh, steps to understand what's critical um, within that, that, that continuum uh, or that flow and uh, to understand what potential risks are there, what planning needs to be done, uh, and then working with those vendors to make sure, and, and the business to make sure that contracts are set up appropriately, that the relationships are well understood um, uh, internally and externally, uh, and that you start building plans to support um, not only the individual components of, of that supply chain um, I keep using the word continuum, but I think it makes sense that it, that we focus focus on it that way uh, within that supply chain continuum, um, and then as a collective. So focus on some of the individual pieces, but then as a collective, are all the dependencies mapping up, lining up, etc. Uh, and I think if you start small and and work through, prioritize, uh, hit on the critical stuff, and then uh, make sure that the connections in the appropriate places are being made. It's a good place to start, but the uh, the journey is a long. One. Great. Well, we have to end there. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate your insight on supply chain management. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's been great. I appreciate it. And in the meantime, everyone, stay prepared, everybody. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody. <laughs>